Well, we welcome all of you uh, to this session. It is the first of five adult ed classes that we're planning to do in talking about the five core lessons of trauma healing through the American Bible Society's uh, curriculum. And as we start that, some of you may have been a part of our introduction session on February 7th. Some of you may not have, but either way, we hope that this will be something that introduces you a bit more uh, to the idea of trauma healing. Now, um, first off, I think it's important to start with just a short word of prayer, and then we'll try to introduce a bit about how this first lesson called If God Loves Us, Why Do We Suffer? How we get started with this core lesson. So let's just join our hearts in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for this time of worship today as our hearts continue on this Lenten journey. We thank you that as we gather today, you will speak to us through your word and that you uh, long for us to be whole and healed. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So if anyone would like to help us with some scripture reading, it's the main part of your participation today. So if you have a Bible near you or can gather that quickly, that would help us. Um, and if you want to make notes or anything, uh, you're welcome to have a pen. And paper. Um, but otherwise, Jeff has told us that this session will be recorded, and therefore it could be found in the future on the website. As we start, it's always important when we have a small group to recognize that this is a setting where things are confidential. We are not going to be sharing anything that people share because it's important to know that this is a safe space. It's very different when it's by Zoom. And if we're in person, of course, that may feel even more important. But for you to know that anything that is discussed in these sessions is confidential and uh, you've already muted yourselves. If you want to join us in making a comment or reading scripture for us, then um, just unmute yourself and we will welcome your comments. An important thing to understand as we start trauma healing is three basic principles of well being. Because this curriculum was started by psychologists as well as Bible scholars and missionaries, it really helps us to understand the psychology that allows us to heal. And people hold, they state that three, uh, people hold three core beliefs when life is going well. Number one, I expect regular patterns in life. Number two, I believe there is right and wrong and right wins over wrong. Number three, I am taught and or believe that I am valuable to God and to others. But when something happens in our lives that turns our world upside down, those regular patterns, that belief that right and wrong is the uh, right will win and that we're valuable become completely confused and disorient us. And so trauma healing is really designed to help us address our core beliefs, helps us see real choice in our living and our decisions and helps us realize our value to God and to others. 
So those are some basic principles that are important to understand as we start this lesson. An essential part of the trauma healing process is also participatory. And if we were meeting in group, then we would do skits and readings and poems and a variety of uh, actions that help us to get involved with our bodies as well as our mind and our words. And one of the reasons they say that is because none of us is as smart as all of us together. And that's a real basis for this small group theology of trauma healing. They also emphasize the importance of adult participatory learning. They say that 20% of what we hear, we remember. 30% of what we see, we remember. 70% of what we discuss, we remember. 80% of what we experience, we remember. And 95% of what we teach, we remember. So Lynn and I have learned the process of facilitating or teaching this lesson and it's no question, it helps us to remember <laughs> the importance of healing the wounds of the heart. So as we begin this lesson, if God loves us, why do we suffer? It seems to fit into the message of the worship service, the sermon today. And maybe uh, that's because God... <laughs> always has a way of connecting important things for us in the learning process. So Lynn is just going to show you the arc that um, we talked about. I don't know if you can see it, but suffering is the first element of this arc to trauma healing. And as we move across, that is the process of trauma healing. Okay. So we know you can't see that well, but rather than take the time for screen sharing, we thought we would just show the poster quickly. So as we begin the lesson, we will start with paraphrasing one of the stories that begins this uh, lesson on suffering. It's a story of Pastor Ben, who grew up in South Chicago. His mother was not married, but she did her very best to take care of Ben. But unfortunately, she died suddenly when he was just three years old. It seemed he would go into the foster care system, but his mother's sister, Anne, and her husband, Dan, who already had three children, agreed to take Ben into their home. Now, of course, Ben was frightened and upset when he was taken into Anne and Dan's house, and he showed these feelings by behaving very badly. Dan decided that he needed discipline and often would hit and that just made his behavior even worse. The other three children who were older resented how much time their mother gave to Ben, and they bullied him throughout his younger years. Now, when he went to school, things got a bit better. Time was less within the home, and Ben met someone who was a Christian and went to a youth group while he was in middle school. While he was in the youth group, Ben heard about Jesus and his love, and he chose to accept Jesus into his life. When he finished high school, the youth pastor encouraged him to think about going to a Bible college. And Ben spent three years at the Bible college, felt like his life was so well-grounded, and he was 
given a small church to pastor. He married a, a woman that he had met in college or in, in Bible school, and they eventually had two sons. Ben and Julie's house was near the church in Chicago where they were serving. And unfortunately, gangs became a reality for this whole community. The gangs would fight every week. Ben saw innocent people being shot, including children. Several of the young girls in his church had even been raped and he'd been doing his best as pastor to support the families. The area was becoming more like a war zone. Ben was at a, the church one day preparing for an evening service when he got a call from his wife. Their five-year-old son, Peter, had been hit by a stray bullet. By the time Ben got to the hospital, it was too late. The doctors said that poor Peter had died of the bullet wound. Now, in the weeks after his son's death, Ben said that he still believed in the Bible and that God was going to heal their wounds. And yet, in his quiet moments, Ben was angry with God and felt like he had been deserted. Sometimes he would think that God wasn't strong enough to stop these bad things from happening within their community. And when he thought of God as a loving father, he was having a harder and harder time believing it. Ben actually remembered when he was in Bible school that some of his teachers <laughs> were really atheists. They didn't believe in this God they were teaching. And in his heart, Ben knew that God was with him, but he wondered if his teachers had been right all along. When he saw the terrible things that were going on in the community, he kept believing that God must be punishing them. In his sermons, he spoke more about the judgment of God and less about God's love. He began to feel that he was a hypocrite since he felt God was very far away. Now, that's a dramatic story about Pastor Ben, and yet it brings up many of the elements that we want to talk about today. Can anyone just relate or share what Ben was feeling in his heart about God? If you have something you can remember and want to share, unmute yourself and share with us. What was Ben feeling about God? Sounds like he was feeling that God was punishing or judgmental. And that's why the bad things were happening in his life. Thank you, Becky. Yes, God was punishing them as a community, as a family. Anything else? Ben was feeling abandoned, too. He was feeling abandoned, that's right, because God seemed very far away. And in, and some, I, of the, excuse me, in some of those private uh, moments, I'm sure there were aspects of anger at God. Yes, he was feeling very angry for what they'd suffered as a family, but also for the broader community. Anything else? I don't think uh, Ben felt that God had the power to change anything. That's important. That's right. That he, he thought God must be weaker than the powers that were ruling his community. Anything else? In other words, where was God? 
<laughs> Very good, Myrna. Where was God in the midst of all of this suffering? And I think that we have sort of a preconceived idea of what our life is going to be or what the next few years are. And so he had finally found the love of his life, had children, you expect to see them grow up. And when that's disrupted, it's um, very disorienting. Mm -hmm. That's very good, Jan. Why do you think that, well, that answers the second question. Why do you think Ben feels this way? Because his expectations were different. That's what Jan is telling us. And I think so often that's what throws us into confusion. Just like the first principles, if it's not right over wrong, then what do we do with that information? And I think also if we have been living a right life, if we do follow the commandments, then why God, why does this befall me? Mm -hmm. Did he question the existence of God? I think in the story, it doesn't stay, say that he did, but he had some teachers who influenced him who said they were atheists. So if we're thinking about the elements that, in, that actually spoke into Ben's uh, existence, Atheism was part of that. Thank you, Margaret. Anyone else? Sharon, I don't know if you read the chat. Kathy Anderson put this comment in, very faith crushing when feeling abandoned or misled by mentors, which ties in with what you just said. Thank you. That helps me a lot. If someone sees something in the chat, it would be helpful if you share it because it's hard for me to to look at notes and also look at the chat well. But all of these are important comments about the experience that Pastor Ben is feeling right now. And the question might be, have we ever felt like Pastor Ben? And if we were in the small groups, we would offer an opportunity for you to share with a smaller group. And that's harder to do. This lesson is normally an hour and a half. <laughs> and so for us to try to do the lesson in a short time and break out into breakout sessions, it is uh, a bit difficult. But that is something for you to reflect on. How does Pastor Ben's experience ring or resonate with you as a person who has suffering at different times in our lives. Uh, Sharon, I was yeah. mentioned, <clears throat> took me a while to <laughs> get me unmuted, but um, I think maybe you would feel some guilt also. Why is my, you know, why couldn't I protect my family? from, mm -hmm. you know, um, all that's going around in this neighborhood. Um, also, you know, why is it happening? We always hear that. Why does it help happen to good people? You know, especially in this situation, where there are so many people in that neighborhood where you said it was like a war zone on drugs, I'm sure, you know, gang fighting, everything. Why my son, you know, why? not somebody else that isn't, you know, following, um, like Jan said, the commandments and stuff, um, a righteous life. So, but I think a lot times it's guilt too, especially for parents um, that lose a child. So. That's excellent, Ruth. It's true that so many different emotions, different experiences lead us then into trying to understand if God loves us, and as Christians, we might say that God loves us, why do we suffer? And mm -hmm. uh, we'll move us on to the next session of the lesson. I noticed that uh, some of you did when, G, uh, when Sharon asked about uh, getting a Bible close to you, so I'm assuming that some of you have. I'm going to ask, ask for some of you to look up verses to be able to read to us, short verses. 
Jan, did you get a Bible? Can I give you Genesis 3, 6 to 7 to look up? And uh, Patricia, did you get, did I see you getting one? Could I give you um, Romans 5, 12? And uh, who else has a Bible close at hand that would be willing to read? Myrna? Myrna, can I give you 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9? And I think, Ruth, did you raise your hand? Uh, Romans 8, 19 to 22. So you can go ahead and be looking those up. But as we would hear a story like the one about Pastor Ben, and as we would enter a training on this type, like on the topic of suffering, we would be grappling with age-old human questions. And our object in this section of the training would be to explain how evil and suffering came into the world according to the Bible. Since the Genesis chapter 1 creation account discusses not only God's work of creation, but also just how really good it all was, we would want to try to understand from the biblical perspective what changed all that goodness. So for some of our large group participation, we would typically ask the group, why is there evil and suffering in the world according to the Bible? And so let me put that question to you as the group. Uh, I'd like for you, if you have a reply to that question, I'd like you to unmute and say, uh, give some uh, explanation. You know, according to the Bible, why is there evil and suffering in the world? Because man ate of the fruit of the tree of um, knowledge and could see what good and evil were. Yes, the story of, of Adam and Eve uh, eating that fruit that they were forbidden to eat. And so they made that choice and uh, they suffered uh, from it. And uh, 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 Jan, if you could read the Genesis uh, verses, please. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Thank you. So the, that, that story, which we all know, is, is one of the main answers, of course, to that question that the Bible gives. But of course, what Adam and Eve did also had some effect on humanity as a whole, um, because now all humanity was kind of stuck in that situation. Uh, could we hear, uh, I think, I, was it Patty, I gave you Romans uh, 5. Well, if you'd read that, please. Mm -hmm. And this is from the New International Version. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Thank you. So Adam and Eve had made that choice. We got landed with uh, some of the outcome. But in fact, when we think about um, evil and suffering in the world, who, who else has a choice as far as uh, doing right or wrong? Is it, was it just Adam and Eve? Anybody else have a choice? I think we have that same choice every day. <laughs> That's My exactly right. It benefits me like knowledge of everything or something good to eat and how much am I willing to give up? of what I believe to get Indeed. that. It is, it is our choice as well uh, we have to make. And so choice is one of the main answers from the Bible. What other, can you name another reason that the Bible says there's evil and suffering in the world? Has 
as a think about a source of that evil and uh, suffering. The disobedience I, of God who said, don't eat from that tree. So disobedience. Disobedience. Okay. Yeah. I've always thought there's uh, bad or evil things because there's Satan always trying to uh, <laughs> fight God. Exactly. That's right. Satan, the underlying evil person or presence, personality, uh, spirit at work, uh, full of lies and lies and murder and deception. Uh, I gave, uh, it was, maybe it was Myrna, uh, did you have First Peter 5? Did you read that? Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around you looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. Indeed, so the Bible names, uh, specifically names out uh, the devil or Satan to be one of the underlying factors for our, the evil and suffering in the world. And there, of course, is this the concept of, of a damaged creation um, that we see in the Bible, a result of what Adam and Eve did with their disobedience, that all of creation has been somehow damaged or, or, or in bondage, uh, groaning to be freed from its brokenness. Uh, Ruth, would you please read from Romans 8? Uh, yeah, uh, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Thank you. So the Bible would seem to indicate that it's really not, God is not the cause of the suffering in the world, but that uh, these are the results of, or of Satan or choice or the creation being damaged. And so in finishing up this section of the lesson, we would also ask, you know, if, if there was a risk that evil might enter the world, why did God still give us a choice? Anybody have a, a thought on that? I've always felt that if we were puppets and he just pulled the string, um, we wouldn't really have freedom we would be our, our choices would be made for us instead of our having agency thank you we wouldn't have freedom well, one other thing I, I, yes go ahead I, I, I would add that God seeks relationship that God seeks <laughs> our love and yeah. if we have no choice to give that or to withhold that then it means nothing and so mm -hmm. the power of freedom or the freedom of choice comes from God's desire to love us and to have us love him. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. I appreciate that. I think, you know, if we hadn't thought about it, really, could love exist without a choice to love? Um, so I, I think, I think not. So thank you. Uh, sure. <laughs> Some of you seem to have read the lesson already and are contributing because those are important foundations for us as we continue in this uh, lesson. So when we're suffering, what can make it hard to believe in God's love? When we've talked about this and uh, we say that God did not cause suffering, Yet we know this, we still struggle to make sense of our experience. When our world is thrown off by a serious wound or the loss of a loved one, a spouse, if we struggle with trying to understand what does this pandemic mean for our country, our world, all of those wounds can throw us 
and we are then confused and have to sort out for our for our community what does God's love really mean for us today now the reality is that we heard about culture today in our worship service and it's important to understand what our culture speaks into our lives before we even think more about how do we then interpret God's love in the midst of suffering. So the question that we want you to uh, offer some uh, input, what does our culture tell us about God? What does it tell us God is like when we are suffering? If you'd like to share an answer, just unmute and share with us, please. And I'll keep track on my paper here. What does our culture tell us about God in the midst of suffering? So I'm gonna jump in here real quick. Um, that's okay, because Mike's trying to answer too. So maybe both of us will answer. But um, <laughs> I think our American culture was uh -huh. all about immediate responses to things. Um, is a huge judgment for this and patience, you know, the fruits of the spirit include patience and we are not a patient culture in the slightest. Um, we want answers now. Um, mm -hmm. That idea of God's not driving the car, we're driving the car. Um, God didn't cause that accident or for that life to be taken. God is crying with us and um, the patience to know that time um, might help us understand more what's going on. We just have to give things time. And I'm kind of coming from the perspective that I know that Becky Benson can talk, speak to a lot more when um, families lose children. I can't, it's one of the hardest things I've ever dealt with is helping a family through that trauma of losing a child. Do you want to say something? Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, well, I was going to say to Kathy, I, I think, uh, when you hear someone who's uh, challenging faith or challenging the church or say they're not very engaged in church, uh, to me, the, the two things that they most often would say is the church has caused so many wars and where was God when that hurricane or that tornado or that famine or the pandemic? You know, so I, in society in general, I think it's, uh, it's hitting the nail on the head. It's a big issue, <laughs> big question. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's very true. I Other think is what our culture tells us about God in the midst of suffering. Yeah, um, it's Ruth here. And I think um, we're quick in our culture and our general, you know, world culture. We're quick to put blame on something right away. Like Kathy says, there's no patience, but um, we always want to find a cause or a blame for it. And sometimes oh. there is. Yes. Very true, thank you. And you know, readings that I've been doing recently about Black Lives Matter, I think I was very angry at God and saying, you know, um, how long, oh God, must I suffer after my husband died? Uh, 400 years of slavery and still our Afri African community is oppressed um, and yet the videos that we saw, I think, as a church on black churches, somehow they have kept the faith. And it sort of puts upon me, Jan, can't you wait at least, you know, a few months? <laughs> um, you've yeah. been so blessed and they have suffered so long. Thank you, Jan. Any other thoughts that our culture tells us? I think one that one oh. last our culture will be quick to blame uh, God. The, the phrase has been uh, cited before, of where is your God? But um, unfortunately, some of our sects of Christianity will say that your God is a vengeful God, and not a forgiving God. And so that whole aspect of guilt, blame, and vengeance, the bad trilogy. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. One of, the th one of the things that I've been thinking of is we, we want to see God as a father, God as the caretaker, 
And I think that when bad things happen, you know, as, as a parent, the, the hope is that you would try to shelter your child. You would try to prevent your child from harm. You would try to, you know, comfort and protect. And so when bad things happen, you wonder, you know, God as that protector, where, what, you know, that it's, it's a, um, attention. And right along with what Becca is saying, we think of him as all powerful. You know, if he wanted to, he could do something about this is sort of the human way of reacting. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I think in re relation to our culture, I think we have had a me generation for many generations. And um, there isn't a drive um, to look at the larger perspective. It's not the first question as to, and this goes back to the immediacy. Uh, we want an answer right away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary Beth. That's true. Other thoughts? You just have to be patient and and be patient. And so God will help you. You just have to be patient. That's very, very true. Thank you for sharing that. And as our culture, we don't tend to be very patient. It's already been brought up. We are a culture that wants immediate results. And that's not um, where we... Um, are often met when things are difficult in our lives. So some cultural beliefs that we've talked about are actually the same as what we might hear in the Bible or in the church, and it helps us as we go through suffering. But other beliefs may be very different, and these cultural beliefs may come to mind when we suffer and cause us to doubt God's love. And that is what Pastor Ben, I think, was beginning to bring up was this idea that maybe there really isn't a powerful God, maybe there really isn't a God at all. And those are uh, in affecting him as he's dealing with the trauma that was in the story. So what we need to do, if we were in class, we would have a poster or a whiteboard that we list all of the cultural beliefs. And very quickly, some of them are uh, the, the impatience that we have as a culture that we want an immediate response that we hear in our culture your God must not exist. If this happened, that means that God is not here. He doesn't care. He's not loving. And we're very quick as a culture to put blame on something or someone. We hear that God must be vengeful instead of loving, that he's not the protector if our children or our family or our community have a major loss. And I think the importance it was brought up about the me generation. I think there are many of us who grow up in the US now who see ourselves as the center of our world. And that's very different from a, a world where Jesus calls us to care for other people and to love him. So what I need is some people to help me with some Bible verses again. Is there anyone who has a Bible that would be willing to read a short scripture? Raise your hand or speak. <laughs> Dee Dee, I'm going to ask you to uh, read Psalm 96 verses 4 to 6. Someone else? Mary Beth, um, how about you read Matthew 9, 
35 to 36. Nicole, would you read Psalm 34, verse 18? And someone else? Uh -huh. Paul. Paul. <laughs> I, I can't always see the movements here, but Paul, I could if you, if you I could. would read Romans 8, 31 to 39. As we will discover in the process of this, there are so many scriptures that speak into this. But we want to think, okay, if our culture says one thing, what does the Bible teach us about God in times of suffering? And rather than asking people to share uh, your own comments to cut down on time, I'm going to suggest that we listen to these scriptures. So Psalm 96, verse 4 to 6. Didi, I think that was you. Yes, it is. Starting at verse four. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Thank you. So that speaks very clearly about our powerful God uh, who created all things. Matthew. Yes, Matthew 9. 9 35 yeah. through 36. Mm -hmm. I'm just double checking. I got the right chapter. I'm sorry. That's okay. Matthew 9, verses 35 and 36. Okay. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Thank you. So that is one of many verses that speaks about how God uh, looks through Jesus at suffering and the compassion that Jesus shared with the people that he was with. Um, I think it was Nicole. You had Psalm 34, 18. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. The Lord is near to the... <clears throat> to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Thank you. In our brokenness, God is near. And that is what the Bible says over and over as we read his word. And Paul, uh, Romans 8, 31 to 39. Right, and this is in the second sec of the New International Version that's titled More Than Conquerors. And the section you requested follows uh, this passage, which I think links very much into it. And we know that in all things God works for the good of all who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And then with 31, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Those whom God has chosen, is it God who justifies? Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? 
as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Paul. We heard part of that scripture in the service today as well. And it really reminds us that God's love is greater than anything we can imagine or anything our world might tell us. And, um, and that scripture is one that I know many of us cling to in the midst of very difficult times. And a scripture that came to mind this morning as I was waking up was um, from Jonah. Uh, Jonah 4 verse 1 and 2 said, Jonah was greatly displaced, pleased, and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so clicked, quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. So Jonah ran away from what God called him to do because he knew God was so loving and was slow to anger. And many people will emphasize God and his judgment or his vengeance. And yet we know from the scripture that God is living with us, is present with us. He sent Jesus to be with us and to show his love. And Lynn will continue with the next section. Well, at this point in our, if we were doing the training, we would have several people in the group uh, do a skit. Now we would give them the lines uh, written down. They wouldn't have to do this ad lib, but they would uh, do this uh, skit and it would illustrate certain teachings that people might hear from Christian friends or from radio TV preachers. Uh, sometimes. So it, the setting would be something like this. Uh, a mother who had just experienced a very severe trauma, say her young child had just died from uh, in a very traumatic way, gunshot like maybe we, we heard about before. And so the mother turns to Christian radio for comfort. And in the first program she turns on, she might hear the preacher uh, talking about sin in your life and God's punishment for it. And the, the mom reacts, thinks that, oh, it must be sin that I committed that, that must have caused this, the, this evil to happen, my child's death, uh, but she's unsure of which sin it is or what she should be confessing. So she turns the, the radio dial and she, she finds another preacher. She hears as uh, the preacher talking about our need to pray more, our need to fast more, our need to give more to the church uh, to do more so that our prayers will be answered. And she thinks to herself, oh, that's maybe where, why this all happened. I wasn't, wasn't praying enough. I wasn't giving enough. I wasn't doing enough. Uh, and God is displeased, and that's why this happened. And then she turns to another station and hears uh, the preacher preaching on our need for more faith, and that if we had more faith in our lives, then we will stay uh, healthy and, and become wealthy and be prosperous. And she concludes, ah, it was my lack of faith that, that caused my child to die. So that, that would be the skit we would have done. And at the end of the skit, we would have actually the, the group pick out and talk about these teachings that, that we just went through uh, that may make it hard for us uh, to believe that, that God uh, really loves us in, in the midst of our suffering. So like, you know, God is, is uh, just angry and he's quick to punish sin, or, or God is uh, unhappy with us because we aren't doing enough, we're not following uh, along in terms of praying to him regularly or, or, or giving enough, 
or or the prosperity gospel aspect that it, and if if we just have enough faith we'll be we will always be healthy wealthy and and uh wise and so all of these things uh, we would break out into small groups and discuss these and many other such teachings uh, uh, that may cause us to doubt god's love and then they would groups would come back together together and, and give uh, feedback to the larger group and we discuss about these topics and have some scriptures that go with them for example the one about god being quick to punish uh, we would discuss the other side, the other biblical characteristics of God, like, like his love, which is in uh, 1 John 4, uh, 9 through 11. God's love was revealed to us among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to die for us. Or on the other topic about we haven't done enough to please God, we would discuss that God's love is not based on our behavior. We read the scriptures that discuss why he loves us, like in Titus um, verses, chapter 3, verses, uh, verse four, uh, 5, he saved us not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And one of my favorites, Romans uh, 5, uh, verse 8, but God proves his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, yet Christ died for us. So it's not, we don't, we're not earning that love from God. He has it for us already. And lastly, the, the prosperity one, uh, prosperity for all believers who have enough faith we need to make sure that we, we remember how much uh, some of his most faithful servants, like Paul, suffered tremendous hardships. And so reading uh, one of Paul's writings uh, from Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 29, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Sharon? We can see that our time is drawing to a close, but just to summarize quickly other experiences that can play into people's beliefs about God in the midst of suffering. One is if someone has had a really bad experience with the church. Many people grow up in the church and reject it, whether they reject it during high school, during college, for other reasons. But if they've had a bad experience with a church community, it leads into their understanding and their beliefs regarding God and suffering. And another is regarding challenges or bad experiences with earthly parents. We know many who have been abused by mothers or fathers and their interpretation of God as a loving father is definitely not the same as mine might be if I really believed and loved that my God, my father, my earthly father was caring for me. So those experiences are part of a person's own understanding of God in the midst of suffering. And as we move on, we would break into small groups and we would discuss that. And normally we would break people into groups of just two so that people could share those challenging experiences with the church in the past or with an earthly parent who has uh, not been the kind of parent that we believe uh, all children deserve. So Lynn is going to finish off this lesson as we look at how can we remember God's love in times of suffering. Yes, during this last, last uh, lesson, we would uh, pose the question, as I am to you now, how can we remember um, God's love in the midst of our time of suffering? So are there ways that, that we can remind ourselves or remember uh, what would be some ways 
if you would have an answer for that question. Jim? A phrase that I keep thinking of is let go and let God. Just let go and let God. Getting to not try to maintain all the control and allowing God to work. With you, letting God work, yes. Not not trying to control it ourselves, but letting letting God have control of it. Yes. What? Uh, anything else? I other think you, you can look up in a, a concordance or other sources. What are the verses that deal with suffering? And just reading the Bible, those verses that particularly speak to that issue may be helpful. Thank you so much, Jan. Reading, reading God's word would be one way as we're reminded in 2 Timothy about how God's word is, is, is helpful for us. Uh, yes, Tim. And, and often songs are a way to remember that. So one of the simple ones, of course, Jesus loves me, but there are, you know, other songs that can come to mind that help us to remember God loves us. Thank you. Songs, songs can do that. Yes. Anything? One thing, one thing that helps me uh, when I get negative on stuff that's going on in my life is a to think of the blessings because I think if I did write down everything, my blessings would be I couldn't even list all my blessings. Uh, so I know it would be much uh, greater. And that um, to, as soon as I feel like, well, maybe I have to go through this suffering because it's gonna, I'm gonna become someone. I try to find my purpose in life and what the Lord wants me to live and do and be. And so I'll be like, well, maybe I'm supposed to learn this lesson and then I can go out and teach others about it or it, things like that. So sometimes I think maybe I have to go through this suffering because it's going to make me a better person or something where I can then become a teacher for someone else. Thank you. Or you could be you can be a blessing to others for, uh, after you've been reminded of the number of times you've been blessed by God. You can correct be a yes blesser of other people. Thank you. Even and if, yes, go ahead. Follow up with what Mary just said is that's when my brothers and sisters in the church become the most important to me. So I can reach out to all of you um, to help remind me of God's love. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Fellowship. We're encouraged by the Bible and, and Acts, you know, we, we, are, we, are we are continually urged to meet together in fellowship or be together in fellowship. And part of the reason is to be able to encourage one another as we go through these times. So there are, there are ways, indeed, that we can remember what God has done for us in the past and use those uh, gifts that he has given to us to be able to move through this time. Uh, the gifts of prayer, the gifts of fellowship, the gifts of other believers, the gifts of even being able to serve one another. But I would also like to suggest that we can, we can spend time meditating on God's character during our suffering. And if we were doing a training, a one option would be to have us break out for 15 minutes and, and do uh, something with art that reminds us, uh, creates something, maybe a drawing to remind us of, of how God has been faithful or the ways that we can, can go through suffering uh, with God. But instead, we're on Zoom. We're going to close today with a, a very brief exercise, which can help us to meditate a bit on God's character. And um, then I think Naya Mooch unmuted a minute ago and never did get to talk. Naya oh, Mooch, uh, unmute. What did you want to say? Say something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just going to add um, just when um, Lynn said that um, when I'm going through all time and remembering God, um, usually I just, I just pause and con my blessing and think of I'm still here so I can um, um, look back and see what I've been blessed off and think of what I can do to um, remember God that God loved. Thank you. Thank you, Neemwaj. Remembering God and all 
the way he stood by us. If you think back in your life, you think about um, ev- all those things that he's taken you through before. It's good to remember he, he is that way and he is faithful. He will continue to carry you. Thank you. Well, we're going to do this, this brief exercise that can help uh, you experience God's love. And I, I'm going to invite you, as we did, if you were on last week's uh, session, to, uh, to close your eyes if you wish. And if you want to shut off your, your video, you're welcome to do this. This will just be for uh, a minute or two. And close your eyes and um, just uh, listen to these words in, uh, uh, of Scripture. Um, it may be hard for you to receive love from God because you view him through the lens of your earthly parents. But God's pure and genuine love will not harm you. As you reflect on the following verses, they may help you to get a better sense of just how much God does love you. Yet I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Cast cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. As a father is kind to his children, so the Lord is kind to those who honor him. You may open your eyes and turn your video on if you would like. So I would ask you to think about, as as we leave, you don't have to comment verbally on this now, but just As we leave the session, as you leave the session, think about one thing that you did learn from the session and and remember that. So as we finish up today, we recognize, uh, or you can see, this, this lesson and all of them have so much information, especially if we were to meet in person, it would likely take one and a half and sometimes two hours to go through these sessions, but it is a reminder today for us to look again at our understanding of suffering and remembering our God as we go through that suffering. And it is a basis for which the next lesson of looking at the wounds of our own hearts Um, It is important to have this basis of understanding as we move into the second lesson. So um, if we had time, we'd ask for more questions or comments. I guess I'd suggest if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send uh, me uh, an email or Pastor Kyle or Pastor Rob, and we will be connecting between the sessions And um, if there are any real concerns, uh, then feel free. uh, I guess I should put in my email into the chat. And um, also, I'll put our phone numbers so that if there is any 
need for someone to contact us, we'd be very happy to answer your comments or questions. And then Lynn will close us in prayer. So let's pray. We give you thanks, Lord, for your love, which has carried us through this time of sharing. We, we do cast our cares upon you because we know uh, that you care for us. And so even though, even in amongst this group where we, we have not had time to share what's weighing on our hearts, particularly right now, uh, we know that some of us are carrying heavy burdens. And so we, we, we cast them upon your strong arms. Uh, we remember how you have been faithful in the past, and we know that you will lead us forward in the, in the future. So thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, for being with us at all times, even through our times of suffering. For we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And yes, we will have a PDF, um, uh, a notice with some of the information or basic outline of the lesson. Each week we will do that. And so um, again, it's this is a process we're learning from and we thank you for having the courage to join us as we continue in these lessons on trauma healing. So thanks everyone, have a great day. And we'll hope- Thank you against you. Ohio State today. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Okay, bye.